Hey, thanks for joining us here at the LifePoint Church YouTube page. Really quick, before the message, three things that you can do. Number one, subscribe. We want you to be the first to know when we're dropping new messages. Number two, interact. Hop in the comments and chat with us. We want to do this thing with you. And number three, share this message with someone you care about. And never forget, God loves you and he has a plan for you. Now enjoy the message. Man, good morning. Good morning, man. It is so good to see all of you here this morning. Welcome to all of you watching online, in the parent building room, in the lounge, wherever you're at. Thank you for joining us today. But I'm excited for today. This is week two of a series we started called Trending When Faith Goes Viral. Where last week we talked all about how there's some things that maybe we need to start or stop in our life in order to grow in our faith. And, and here's the deal. Last weekend I asked you guys to commit to one of four things or multiple of four things, either going to if for ladies or going to starting point or, or praying, God, how can I increase my faith? Folks, I am so proud to be a part of a church that says, I want to make decisions. I want to choose to take steps in Christ. I have a stack of connection cards on my desk that I got to pray through throughout the whole week. And so I, I reiterate what Pastor Doug says, I'm proud of our church and I'm proud to be a part of it. But I'm glad that you're here. We're in week two of this and we're going to continue to look at how do we really fight for a healthy faith? Like, how do, how do we do that? In fact, here's, here's our theme verse. I announced it last week. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It says that we walk by faith and not by sight, right? We walk by faith and not by sight. And what that means is that it puts a huge emphasis on our faith. But I think like Pastor Doug said, like there, I think it takes a lot of, of right choices along the way as well. In fact, let me just ask, how many of you remember a guy named by the name of Larry Walters? Anybody know of Larry Walters? Anybody in here? Maybe after I tell you a little bit of story, you'll remember his, his story. But, but Larry lived a really long time ago, back in the 1980s. <laughs> and... <laughs> Here's the remember back in the 80s where, where if, you had to, if you wanted to find out anything that was going viral, like you had to get there for the 6 o'clock news, right? And you had to be there, just click on the button, you know, all that. It was back in the dark ages. Don't worry about it. Anyway, it was Larry Walters. Here's what Larry Walters. Larry, was, Larry had a dream. His dream was that he wanted to be an Air Force pilot, okay? That's what he wanted to be his whole life. That's what he wanted. But he had bad eyesight. And so they rejected his application. And so when he was 33 years old, he was a truck driver in California. He said, I don't care. I'm going to fulfill my dream. So here's what he did. And maybe, maybe you remember this. He went down to the local, local army surplus store and he bought 45, 45 weather balloons. And he packed them with helium. Some of y'all remember this story? But like he packed them with helium. And here's what, here's what his thought was. He was going to attach these 45 weather balloons to a lawn chair. We got a picture. Here's, here's what it is. Here's what he's going to do. Here was his plan. So he went down. He went down and he said, okay, this, I'm going to just grab some stuff out of my house while I'm up here. So he, he grabbed some sandwiches. He grabs a camera. He grabbed a pellet gun because he thought, I'm just going to shoot some of the things down for when I get, you know, whatever, and just be able to come down. Grab. He grabbed a pellet gun. He grabbed a six-pack of beer, obviously, right? I mean, sure, why not? What could go wrong? So his idea was this. He's like, so he got all of his buddies around, right? He gets all of his buddies. He says, here's, here's my plan, guys. Here's what I want to do. I'm a, I want you all to cut the cord. And when you cut the cord, here's, I, I'm going I'm to probably float up to about 100 feet, whatever, right around there. I'm just going to hang out for a little while. And I'll shoot the, I'll shoot the balloons down and I'll, I'll be able to come down. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. It was like the ultimate dude hold my beer moment. <laughs> it's like the ultimate, right? The ultimate. Absolutely. Here's what happens. His boys, they all cut the cords. He doesn't float to 100 feet. He doesn't float to 200. He doesn't even float to 1,000 feet. He shoots up like a rocket to 16,000 feet in the air. We have pictures. Here they are. This is him. But here, show me the other one. It's like stacked. Like he stacked them on stacks. My guy went to 16,000 feet up in there. He's up there for four hours. Four hours. It's minus two degrees. He's getting hypothermia. He's like having altitude sickness, all this stuff. And, and here's what happened at the end of it. He gets interviewed by David Letterman. David said, dude, why didn't you shoot down the balloons? My guy looks at him and says, bro, if you're up at 16,000 square you know, feet, you ain't shooting the balloons down either. And so he didn't do it. So eventually he, he starts coming, the helium starts coming out, he starts coming down a little bit. He's like, okay, maybe. And, and you know what happens? He starts venturing into LAX. Yeah. 
A DC-10 airline spots him, calls, you know, the control tower. Hey, we got a guy in balloons in a lawn chair up here. <laughs> They're like, the heck? You know, like, what is happening? He ends up coming down, shoots a couple balloons down when he gets lower, you know. So he hits this tree, gets out of the whole thing, you know. Grab, he, he gets to the ground. He grabs his lawn chair. We have a picture. He grabs his lawn chair, starts walking, gets arrested, and this, this, this reporter yells out while he's, while he's getting arrested, hey, Larry, why'd you do it? He stops, he looks at him and says, well, man just can't sit around. <laughs> like that was his big line. Like that, that was the whole thing, right? And see, here's the deal. Like, like I think Larry just, just accomplished his goal. He was able to accomplish his dream and all of it worked out right up until it didn't. Well, here's the sad part. About 10 years later, Larry actually took his life. He took his life. And, and, and it was because of all of the demons that, that he was working through. He was never able to overcome them. And see, isn't it true? Like I tell that story because isn't it not true that sometimes, you know, we can, we can even be living our best life. We can be living our dreams. But is it not true that we're still living with issues as well? Like we're still living with insecurity issues. We're still living with self-worth issues. We're still living with maybe childhood baggage or, or relational baggage. You know, I've been pastoring for, for 23 years now, full-time pastoring 23 years. You know one of, the, one of the most insidious types of baggage that I have to deal with all the time? Religious baggage. Anybody ever gone through that? Religious, religious baggage? Or maybe it's, 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 you know that you've gone through it because you've said things like, yeah, I lived in a really controlling household. Or I've been really hurt by, by religion in the past. And, and folks, I'm not even talking about like scary religion, okay? Like animal rituals and man, I had to marry my third cousin by the time I was 12. Like that's a scary religion, you know? I'm talking about the religion that, that actually, at, at first sight, it can look good. It can sound good, right? I mean, people, people, people can recite scripture. They even talk about, about Jesus. But the more and more you get into it, the more and more maybe you find out it's not all that cracked up, all that it was cracked up to be. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah. Matthew, here's what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 6. Here's what he says. Be careful, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's before we go any further, I'm going to give you just a short little Bible lesson, and I'm definitely going to be teaching a whole lot more than preaching today, really. Uh, but here's the thing. Whenever you read through Scripture and you see the word yeast, typically it's talking about something that's evil. And Jesus is talking about it in this instance where he divides it up into two different people groups, two different categories. And one is the Sadducees. And again, maybe, maybe some of you have heard of the Sadducees before. But here's what the Sadducees were. These were people who loved religion. They loved it. They believed in it absolutely. But here's what they didn't believe. They didn't believe that God was personal. They didn't believe that God really, really cared. Where it was the kind of faith that if it was going to be, it was going to be up to me. And so you just, Jesus talks, talks about these people. He talks against these people, but not all that much. Because honestly, it wasn't really a religion or, or a lifestyle that most people wanted to live. The second type of person that he talks about is the Pharisee. And the Pharisee is, is, is someone who, again, yes, loved religion, but also really, really loved God. The Pharisees were kind of the, kind of the back to the Bible type of movement gone bad, where, where, where they absolutely believed what it was that they were saying. But, but, but today, if, if you look at some you know, Christian circles and you said you called someone a Pharisee today, people like, they'd be offended, right? Well, if you called someone a Pharisee back then in Jesus' day, they'd be like, wow, they'd be honored. They'd be like, yes, Absolutely. And it's the reason why is because they were so disciplined and uncompromising in their faith. In fact, in a society that was, that was riddled with, with moral decay, they stood for what they thought was right, which again, wasn't bad. And yet in all of that, Jesus actually points this out. He says they, 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 they stand firm, but they miss the point. In fact, in Revelation chapter 2, and I know anytime I ever say Revelation, like some of you are like, oh, that's the spooky book with killer clowns. No, it's not. It's all about Jesus. But God is speaking in there. He's speaking to the churches, right? He's speaking to us. We're the body of Christ, the churches. And he says this, hey, I know of your determination. I know of your dedication. I know of your good deeds. I know your good doctrine. And all of it sounds good. But he says, here's the problem. You've lost your first love. He says, there's lots of zeal, right? Just like it says in Romans 12, there's lots of zeal, but your religion is poisonous. And in all of that zeal, here's what you've lost. You lost Jesus. In the midst of all this, you've lost you, and it's hurting you. And so this morning, that's what I want to talk about. 
I want to talk about, how, how do we, again, how do we fight for spiritual health? Like, like, how do we fight for an authentic faith that's honoring to God, honoring to Him? And here's why. Here's why it's important, because what we believe determines what we do, right? What we believe determines what we do. And so before we kind of get to, get to how do we fight for it, I, I, I want to see if maybe we've slipped into some of these pharisaical thoughts. There's a, there's a term out there from one of my most favorite authors, and he calls it an accidental Pharisee. Where maybe sometimes we, we can slip into some of these things where maybe we become an accidental Pharisee. There's three things I wanted you to write down. So if you want to take notes, pull that outline out of your program. If you're online, just press the button. But here's one way. There's three of them. Here's one way that maybe we can see that our faith has become toxic. Number one is that we become rules focused. Rules focused. And see, here's the challenge. Jesus said that, that if you love me, then you're going to keep my commandments. And so obedience is huge and it's great the problem occurs when our definition of obedience goes beyond Scripture. Here's what I mean by that. I, and I'll just give you an example. You know, Pastor Doug said he, he mentioned generosity, right? Where the Bible absolutely calls us to generosity. But you know what religion calls us to? A simple lifestyle. And again, it's subtle and it's not bad. But it goes beyond Scripture. Or maybe Scripture calls us to mercy. But you know what we do? We define it. And typically when we do that, we start putting expectations on other people around it where we're often, you know, we want other people to define it exactly the same way that we do. And again, everything, it's all important. But can I tell you this? You can't place expectations on other people that maybe the Holy Spirit is assigning them to something different. That maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, I want them to do something else, but you're putting expectation on them. And again, there's nothing wrong with the premise of, of all of these important things, but it can so easily delve into legalism very, very quickly. You know what happens? We start living in bondage and not in the freedom that Christ affords us. That's what can begin to happen. You know what else happens typically when that, when that goes on? Is we can start playing the comparison game. Anybody ever play the comparison game before? Yeah. Here's the thing, though. Normally, when we play the comparison game, we don't ever really compare ourselves to people who are amazing, do we? Like, we never really compare ourselves to, like, Mother Teresa, right? We don't compare ourselves to Billy Graham or T.D. Jakes or, or any of these amazing, amazing... No, no, no. Typically, here's how it goes. Oh, man, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm not perfect. Come on. But, but at least I'm not, you know, Hitler. I'm not Dahmer, right? I'm not Nicki Minaj or whatever the heck you want to do where legalism is always way more about the rules than the relationship. By the way, this is in stark contrast with the way Jesus lived. Jesus always put the relationship. He always elevated the relationship. And if you don't believe it, read scripture. Like if you remember the woman at the well, right? He elevated, or remember the woman who was caught in adultery and thrown at his feet? He said, he who has not sinned cast the first stone. In fact, the only time Jesus ever really got angry was when he was dealing with, with people who had succumbed to legalism. And again, I've been, I've been doing this for 23 years. You know what I've never heard? I've never had anyone come into my office and say, Russ, I think I'm being a Pharisee. Like I've never heard that in my, whole, in my whole life. And yet there's so many times where so many of us, myself included, have succumbed to it. In fact, I'll give you a few easy ways that you can spot this, right? A few easy ways that, that you can spot whether or, not, whether or not you can see legalism or pharisaical thoughts in other people or, or in yourself. Uh, by the way, here, here's the problem with legalism. Increased legalism, you know what it, what it does? It decreases grace, right? Increased legalism decreases grace. Uh, and again, here's why I'm telling you this, and it's not in your notes. You can write it down if you want to, because I'm not going to say something on Sundays you can't use on Monday, right? Here's three ways. Here's three ways that you can see if they're legalistic. They're, one is that they're easily disappointed. Legalistic people are easily disappointed. And folks, it's a big one, because again, this is where we, we place spiritual expectations on others, and we get disappointed when they don't live up to them. Here's another one. Number two is that, is that they're easily shocked, right? I mean, you ever heard someone say, whoa, I don't believe they did that. Or I don't believe they, they said that, right? And then the last one is this, is that they're easily offended. And again, if you're easily offended, you're easily defeated. Look at the message paraphrase in Luke eleven thirty eight. Here's what it says. So the Pharisee was shocked and somewhat offended when he saw that Jesus didn't wash up before the meal. And see, I'll be honest with you, my mama would have been disappointed with Jesus at that moment too, okay? <laughs> really. But here's what just happened. Here's what just happened. This particular Pharisee felt more righteous than God because he focused on the outward where not even God could measure up. Number one, we can become rules focused. Here's the second one. Number two is that we use guilt to control. Anybody in here ever grow up in a religious environment where guilt was a primary motivational tool? That and a brown leather belt? Anybody in here? Yeah. 
And see, see, let me let me just tell you how you can spot that in your own life. It, it's when our it's when our primary motivation is to point out faults. And again, we, we've all fallen prey to this. Am I am I right? Where typically we we can spot it. You know why? Because we begin using words like should. Or phrases like, like ought to or, or must. And we become really good at, at blaming and condemning and, and denouncing. Look at what it says in Matthew 23, 4. Here's what it says. They tie up heavy cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Folks, I'll give you an example of this from the, from the animal world. Because there's a, there's a particular animal that's super cool but uninvolved. You know what we call those animals? Cats. Yeah. It's true, Right? And some of you love them and you need Jesus, but that's true. In fact, in fact, cats are so cool. Like we name cars after cats, do we not? The jaguar, the cougar, the hellcat. Like it's super cool. You've never seen one car named after a dog, not one. Beagle by Buick. Like it doesn't work. <laughs> Chihuahua by Chrysler. Like it's not a thing, right? Because dogs aren't cool. Cats are cool, but dogs are loyal. They're, they're, they get involved. I mean, folks, you ever seen a C&I cat? You ever seen a search and rescue cat? A guard cat? You ain't never seen none of this. These cats won't raise a finger. But see, here's why I say it. In church, we say it all the time. What do we say? We say, hey, you know, yeah, don't get divorced. And rightfully so. And by the way, that's okay to say someone as long as we're willing to help them in their, help their marriage get healthy. Right? Or, or we say, hey, you know, don't get into, into financial debt and trouble. And, and that's okay. And that's great. As long as we're willing to help people learn biblical stewardship, we're God's the owner of everything, and we simply are managers of what He's given us. And see, if we're not, then maybe we fall in prey to religious legalism. Here's the third one, number three. Last one is this is majoring on the minors. We major on the minors. Larry Osborne, he's, a, he's an amazing author speaker, pastor, mentor for me from afar, all of that. Here's what he says. He says, when I use the Bible as a mirror, I become like Christ. When I use it as binoculars, I become a Pharisee. You know, majoring on the minors, here's what it's like. It's like saying, you know, yeah, I'm good, right? That old saying, I don't go with girls that do or chew or anything else. Like, you know, like, like that's, that's part of majoring on the minors. Or maybe some of you were raised in environments like that where you couldn't play cards, or you couldn't dance, or, or whatever. Kind of, kind of reminds me of that Adam Sandler movie, The Water Boy. Any of you have seen that? It's so good. Like it's a super mentally stimulating movie, is it not? It's like Shakespearean in nature for sure. But everything outside of mama was of the devil, right? Everything was. And see, I say that because for those of us who fall and pray to, to a toxic faith or, or a toxic religion, we can begin to believe that the minors are the majors. It's the reason why Jesus said this in Matthew 23, 24. He says, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. And I know when I read this, some of you are like, Russ, I don't know what that means. I don't speak redneck. I get it. <laughs> but see, here's what was happening. Like Jesus was using Hebrew humor. He was being sarcastic. He was using hyperbole. Where he was, he was, he was talking about the minors. And if you look at the life of Jesus, folks, you'll read it. He never majored on them. In fact, he always cut through the unimportant. And what did he do? He touched on the heart. Matthew 23, 25 says, Jesus said this. He said, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. See, Jesus is saying that our hypocrisy is that our heart doesn't reflect what it is that we're saying. And so what do we do with all this? Like how do we, again, how do we, how, do we, how do we get out of this if we found ourselves in this place? How do we fight for a healthy faith if we become an accidental failure? How do we do this? There's three, three ways I want you to write down. Here's the first one. Number one, first thing we have to do is name our spiritual baggage. You got to name your spiritual baggage. Proverbs 28, 13 says this. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. How many of you can... can how many of you recognize this? Maybe you can see it from down there. Can you see it? Tell me what this is. Irish Spring. Irish Spring. Do y'all remember growing up with this stuff? It's great. She said it sticks. It's great. Listen, I can see like the advertisement. Can you see the advertisement in your mind? People are smelling it. They're like, oh my gosh. You know, this stuff is not allowed in my house anymore. Anybody else with that? 
Thank you, Tanya. The only thing allowed in my house now is this. You know what it is? It's stuff that has like hemp oil and quinoa juice. That's what's allowed in my house. That's it, right? Anybody want this? Because it's not allowed in my house. Anybody want this? Just raise your hand. Seriously. Here we go. Jason, I'm trying not to hit anybody else. There you go. My bad. That's a bad throw, but don't tell anybody that. Never mind. Anyway. In all that, let me just ask this question. How many of you, how many of you, uh, you know, use soap and deodorant on a daily basis? How many? Raise your hand, okay? If you don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> just keep it down. Here's why I bring that, here, here's why I bring that up. And I know it's strange to think about, but folks, one day our bodies are going to deteriorate and they're going to, they're going to rot away, but our soul is eternal. And so because of our bodies, they're, they're more tangible. And honestly, maybe because other people can, can notice, folks, I think we can be super diligent about cleansing them. But is it not also true that we can go days and weeks and months sometimes without asking God to cleanse what's on the inside? Can we do that? And see, I'll be, I'll be honest with you right now. Here, here's where I'm a Pharisee way more often than I'd like to be one, way more often. I can become a Pharisee when I can think about all the things that, that I believe God has called me to do, like, like God has called me to be in ministry and, and I believe that he's given me an assignment in that and, and all the things I can think about, all the things that I'm supposed to produce, right? And when I get around people within my own spheres and pastors and whatnot, I can very easily slip into this thought of, man, why aren't you doing more? How come you're not actually producing? How come you're not working as hard as, as I am? And see, here, here's the truth. Knowledge, self-discipline, personal sacrifice is not the definition of a disciple. Jesus tells us what the definition is. John 13, 35, here's what he says. By, by this, everyone will know that you are my dis- disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. In fact, as a staff, as a pastoral team, we've been going through and trying to define what a disciple is. And you're going to see it come out pretty soon and all the things that we're going to be doing around that. Because here's what we want. We not only want this to be a humongous front door where people can come in and get to know who Jesus is, but we also want to say, okay, Lord, we are moving toward being a disciple that you called us to be. Well, here's here's how we're defining disciple. Here it is. It's not in your notes. You can write it down if you want to. We're going to use Jesus' words. If you remember, when Jesus called Andrew and Peter, here's what he said. If you remember, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He says, follow me, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. Here's the definition of disciple. Write it down. Follow someone who's following Jesus, and I will make you someone who's being changed by Jesus. Fishers of men, someone who's on mission with Jesus. A true disciple of Jesus, someone who's following him, being changed by him, and, and on mission with him as well. And see, when I, fall, when I fall prey to my judgmental spiritual baggage, you know what that's called? It's called playing God, where I'm standing in judgment of others because of pride, and God is against me, and he says, woe to you, you hypocrite. That's what he says to me. Number one, we've got to be able to name our own stuff. Number two, we let God use you. You got to let God use you. And see, here's the thing. When it comes to my household, the Gearhart household definitely has a dilemma in it because my wife, here's what she has. She has a spiritual gift of mercy, okay? And here's, here's what that means. That means she wants to help and she wants to care and she wants to love everyone and everything. And by the way, I mean all the things, okay? Which is why I have sheep and chickens and goats and all the stuff. And by the way, that's us all amazing, except I don't have that gift. In fact, here's what my Bible says, okay? My Bible says that God will take care of the birds of the air and the beats of the field. But apparently my wife seems to think that I'm supposed to be God sometimes. And here's why, because I've got five sheep, 30 chickens. I've got eight cats and two dogs. And by the way, those cats are feral. Don't get it twisted, okay? <laughs> like I don't own them. My do- I just feed them. I don't own them, right? One time my wife, my wife said, babe, but you don't, you don't, here's the thing, you don't allow me to use my spiritual gifts. And it's because I was singing, because I'm praying that you get a different one. <laughs> one that don't cost me. And see, here's the truth. Like God has given her a heart that says, Lord, my resources, my life, my everything is yours. And I love it. I'm just not as good as she is. I'm not as good as my wife. And see, I think I know that, you know, we can sit there and we think, yeah, uh, we, can, we can say, yeah, God, God will definitely use people. But sometimes we can question whether or not he can use us. And, and, and where for most of us, you know, here's what happens. Like we take a step 
And we say, okay, God, I, I want to take a step towards you. What happens when that, when that happens? Like we start thinking these, these doubting thoughts. I might take a step, but ah, am I good enough? Ah, do I know enough scripture? Ah, I don't, not everything in my life is perfect, right? Look at what the Bible says. It says in Ephesians 2.10, that we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things he planned for us long ago. You want to know who, Christ, you want to know who, who God uses throughout the scriptures? There's three people, three types of people. I want you to write them down. Number one, or letter A, is God uses the insecure. You know, last week we talked about Moses. Here's what Moses said in Exodus 4. He said, he said, Oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and, and tongue. God still says, you're the guy I want. Follow me. Letter B, God uses the unlikely. You guys remember the story of David? King David when he was selected? Right, the prophet was supposed to go out and went to Jesse's home and, and Jesse kind of lined up all of his sons prophet said, no, I, none, of those are, none of those are it. And he said, you know, here's what, here's, what, here's what Jesse said. You know, the prophet said, hey, is there any more? And Jesse said, they're, they're, they're still the youngest, but he's tending the sheep. Basically, like, yeah, I got one more, but he's like a liberal arts major, you know? And so he's at work right now asking, would you like fries with that? Like, that's literally what he was saying. And yet David later would become one of the greatest kings in Israel's history and classified as a god of, after a man after God's own heart. Letter C, God uses, also uses the broken. And would that not classify every single one of us in here? He uses the broken. And see, here's my point. My point is that, that your past doesn't discount you from being presently used by God. But I will say this, that part of following Jesus, part of growing in our faith, means participating with him in his, in his work of redeeming the world. Like, believe it or not, that is what he has called you to do. He's called us to help him in partnership redeem the world. Every single one of us. Leads me to the last one. Number three, that we're also called to pursue an authentic faith. We're called to pursue an authentic faith. And I'll just be honest with you. I, I love our church. I, I love it. Because people are, are not only able to be who they are, but they've also been given avenues to grow whether that's on Sunday morning or, or in small groups. I mean, folks, we have hundreds of people that are, that are choosing to grow in Christ outside of Sunday mornings. And I've had the, the privilege of watching them grow closer to God. And because of, because of what God is doing, like he's made LifePoint a place of healing in so many lives, and I'm proud to be a part of it. But I don't think he's done. I think he's got so much more. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.18. It says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of of reconciliation. Here's what that means. Authentic faith is one that pushes us toward grace. It pushes us toward grace. Back in 2018, the Reverend Billy Graham passed away. You guys remember that? He passed away, and obviously he was one of the greatest Christian leaders to, to ever grace this earth. He, he, oh, absolutely amazing. We had his funeral, and I don't know if you watched his funeral, his third daughter, Ruth, she comes up to, this, to the mic and says, everybody has a story of Billy Graham. Everybody's got one. And she says, I do too. And she started telling, I wanted to read a portion of what, of what she said. She said, after 21 years of marriage, I ended in divorce. I was devastated. I decided to live near my older sister and her family, near a good church. Pastor of the church introduced me to a handsome widower. And we began to date fast and furious. My children didn't like him, but they couldn't tell me what to do. I knew what was best for my life. My mother called me from Seattle. My father called me from Tokyo. They said, honey, why don't you slow down? Let us get to know this guy. She said, but in my mind, they'd never been a single parent. They'd never been through the divorce. What do they know? So being stubborn, I married him on New Year's Eve. She said, within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled. I was afraid of him. What was I going to do? She said, I wanted to talk to my mother and father. It was a two-day drive to, to their house. Questions started swirling in my mind. I'd been such a failure. What were they going to say to me? We're tired of fooling with you. We told you not to do it. You embarrassed us. Let me tell you. She says, no, no woman ever wants to embarrass their daddy, especially if your daddy is Billy Graham. She said, we, she said my parents lived on the side of a mountain. And as I wound myself up the mountain, I rounded the last bend in my father's driveway. And my daddy was standing there waiting for me. 
As I got out of the car, he wrapped his arms around me and he said, welcome home, honey. There was no shame, there was no blame, no condemnation, just love. She goes on, she says, my father was obviously not God, but that day he showed me what God was like. And she concludes this way, she said, she said when we come to God with our sin, and our brokenness, and our failure, and our pain, and our hurt, God says, welcome home. And see, I read that because what that is, it's a picture of grace. It's a picture of what God had in mind for you. And see, I don't know what kind of church hurt you've had. I don't know if you've been the one that has the toxic faith. Scripture says that regardless of what might swirl in our minds, God says, I'm wanting you to turn to me. I don't know if you know this, but the Bible says that, that, that God will not only fight for you, but he will fight with you on your side. In fact, the book of, the book of Hebrews writes this. It says that Jesus speaks a better word. That again, regardless of what you might speak to yourself, regardless of the words that you may have heard before when growing up, regardless of the religious baggage or childhood baggage or whatever it is, it says Jesus speaks a better word. And he says, I love you. He says, I care about you. He says that you have worth, that I made you. He speaks a better word. And I think that's what he wants us to be able to receive. Real quick, this is not in my notes, real quick. This is the last service, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Listen, real quick. When God condemned the world a long time ago, right? I, I, well, he, he flooded it. Remember that? Noah. He found one righteous guy. His name was Noah. And he said, Noah, you're going to build a boat and you're going to be all right. He comes out of all that. Comes out of all that. Gets to the end, right? Water subsides. Water subsides. And Noah comes out. And he's with his family. Noah, after that, what happens? I mentioned it multiple times. He, he makes a vineyard. And he, and he what? He, he gets drunk, passed out, naked in a tent. I've told you many times, that's not even good camping etiquette. That's not good. <laughs> Here's why I'm saying that, though. The judgment of God did not cleanse the world. The judgment of God did not cleanse the heart of man. It was the grace of God that cleansed the heart of man. Why? Because it was Jesus. That Jesus took on all of it. And so when it says in Hebrews that, that Jesus speaks a better word, it's not a word of condemnation, but it's one of grace. Which is how we are actually able to change. It's the reason why pharisaical thought processes don't work. It's the reason why formulaic religion doesn't work. It's only by the grace of God, through the sacrifice of Jesus, that we are able to have relationship with him and actually live in freedom. And so I thought of no better way than to understand this than by, or actually just taking communion together. On the night that he was betrayed, while sitting with, with friends and an enemy. He took the bread and he broke it and he said, this represents my body, which I willfully break for you. Take and eat and every time you do, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. In the same way he took the cup he said, this represents my blood, which I willfully shed for you so that you could have life. Take and drink, and every time you do, do it in remembrance of me. Father God, we are so grateful. Lord, your word says that in this world we will have trouble. And God, we all go through it. 
trouble that we cause, trouble that's around us, thoughts that, that betray us, sin. God, and yet we are so grateful that, that your word does say that you speak a better word. That you speak a better word of, of compassion and mercy and grace. That you speak a better word of, of family and relationship, adoption. That we can be your children. And so God, today we give you all the thanks. But God, we also ask, Holy Spirit, I ask that you, would, that you would fall in this place, that you would come and live inside of us, that we'd be able to walk that out, that you would bathe us in your word, in your love, so we could, we could operate the way that you called us to do so, that we would focus on your words and not the world's. God, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you for what you've done. You are God. And we are eternally grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.